Aloha Kako. We're happy to invite the community and those who are our viewers for the Kuali Council series to uh, welcome today another uh, program, a Native Hawaiian program at the uh, uh, Manoa campus. And Kuali'i Council has uh, advocated for about 20 Native Hawaiian programs. So our first three shows have been about um, the history of Kuali'i Council, and then the second one on um, the Native Hawaiian Student Services Center. And the third one was on the Department of Native Hawaiian Health. Today, we're very, very honored to have the School of Law representatives with us. Punihei, would you like to introduce them? Yeah, aloha mai kakou. My name is Kaibi Puni Laib. I'm the Native Hawaiian Affairs Specialist here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And like Nalani said, we're so excited to have three amazing faculty members, um, current and former faculty members, um, with us. Just to, as a recap, um, they are faculty members from Kohuliao Center for Excellence in Native Hawaiian Law at the Richardson School of Law at UH Manoa. Um, Kohuliao has been a longtime member of Kuali'i Council benefiting from the advocacy work of Kuali'i and also participating in the advocacy work of Kuali'i Council to really empower um, Native Hawaiians across the campus. Um, and we have here the Kuali'i Council mission um, on our slide. But today in particular, we have with us Professor Melody Kapili Aloha McKenzie, Director of Kahuliao. Welcome. Aloha. Um, we also have Professor Kapua Ala Sprout, Director of the Environmental Law Clinic. Welcome. Aloha. And then we also have um, Derek Kawanoi, alumnus of the Richardson School of Law, former full-time faculty member there, and now current adjunct faculty. And in addition, um, the governance manager at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. Aloha. Aloha. Welcome. So really, mahalo to all three of you three of you for coming today and making time out of your very busy schedules um, to be with us. Um, as Punihei was mentioning, um, these three people have been faculty and, and uh, Derek was a student at the School of Law and um, they're doing so many important things and making such huge contributions both in the community and research and in publishing so we're excited to hear more about it. But to begin with, um, Melody, could you tell us more about why Kahuliao was established and what the focus of your work is. Sure. I think we have a slide or two um, mm -hmm. that talks about Kahuliao's mission. Um, but I, I wanted to start off with um, Chief Justice William S. Richardson, for whom our law school is named. And it was re really C.J. Richardson's kind of vision in the 1970s that Hawaii needed to have its own law school mm -hmm. so that local students could go to law school, wouldn't have to go away to the continent, um, and that they would then learn Hawaii law, not just U.S. Mm -hmm. law. Mm -hmm. And C.J. Richardson was instrumental in the development of law based on Native Hawaiian tradition and custom. Um, and so he, he envisioned a law school where Hawaii's, Hawaii's people could be represented. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had the honor of, of working with C.J. Richardson mm -hmm. over the years and, um, and then had the honor of being asked to come to the law school to help start Kahuliao. And this was in 2005, um, and I was asked by the dean to come and start our Native Hawaiian Law Program. We were seeking a grant under the Native Hawaiian Education Act, and we received that grant. We were able to start the program um, after about mm, ten, five years or so, the funding kind of ran out, and I have to credit um, Kuali'i Council with its advocacy for Native Hawaiians on this campus mm -hmm. that resulted in a position then being uh, given to the law school for me, and then Kapu'a subsequently getting mm -hmm. another position, and right now we have an even one more position of, uh, of people um, who are we really got the position through the Kuali'i Council. Awesome. And we actually have some slides, I think, uh, of showing our uh, members. But let me start off with this. What is Kuhuliao? It is an academic center. It promotes education, scholarship, community outreach, and collaboration on issues of law, culture, and justice for Native Hawaiians, other indigenous peoples, and Pacific peoples in particular. Mm -hmm. And we uh, received our name as a Makana from um, Kapua's husband, Kala. Mm. Kahuliao basically is um, indicative of turning toward enlightenment, um, which indicates great and profound change through research, scholarship, 
and the awareness brought about by knowledge and understanding. And the, the kauna there with the huli is, yeah. also has to do with the, the kalo and replanting from generation to generation. Absolutely. So that's part of the meaning of kohuliao. And so our faculty, mm -hmm. um, in addition to myself and Kapua, there's Susan Serrano, who is Director of Research and Scholarship, um, Avis Poai, Director of Archives and our Legal History Program. Um, and then we also have faculty with us who are with us part of the time, and then they're assigned also to Hawaii Nui Akea through the Hui Aina Mamona Initiative, Malia Akutagawa and Kamana Beamer. So that's the Kahuliao faculty, basically. Um, what do you think? I think there's another slide that kind of talks about our priority areas, research and scholarship, education, obviously um, classes on Native Hawaiian law and Native Hawaiian issues, and we do have a certificate program I think we're going to talk about mm -hmm. in a little bit. Community outreach is very a very, very important part of what um, Kahuliao does, and, and Kapua will talk about that in more detail. Student outreach, and then our arch archives of Hawaiian legal and historical materials at, in Puna Viola. Yeah. Mahalo. Um, so Melody mentioned that student outreach um, is really important and that historically Native Hawaiian students kind of have been underrepresented in the law school um, as, as the case has been across many areas um, at UH Mano and we've heard about that from other, other on other shows. Um, Derek, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the major initiatives and strategies you've been involved in to recruit students into the law school, um, you know, and then really preparing them to be future faculty if they want, right, or future lawyers or future many things as we will yeah. hear today. Um, and so maybe, and some of your perspective as a former student and former faculty at, at the law school. Can you sure. talk about that? Sure. Um, and you know, the, the interesting thing is uh, when I worked at Kahuliao and I counseled a lot of different students, there were actually only two students who expressed to me that they were interested in uh, teaching law or becoming law professors. Mm. Um, but I know that those two have uh, I think one is clerking now and one just recently graduated. Um, so my understanding is that they're going to try to get some experience. Sure. Uh, but generally what we've done in terms of students who might be interested in either being a faculty member at UH or teaching law somewhere else is really emphasize the importance of academic excellence, mm -hmm. making sure that they uh, do the hard work of doing well in school and right. then also publishing articles in law journals. Mm -hmm. um, so those are, those are some of the specific uh, things that we've advised students to do. Uh, in regards to kind of general initiatives and strategies, I've spoken, uh, when I worked at Kuhuliao, I spoke in classes like your mother's and some other Hawaiian studies uh, classes mm -hmm. to let students know about the recruitment efforts that Kuhuliao uh, worked towards. Um, uh, I think earlier you talked about one of the previous episodes, you featured uh, Native Hawaiian Student Services. Mm -hmm. uh, we did some presentations in collaboration with them where they were able to help us uh, get undergraduate students in the audience to kind of get an understanding of what the law student experience is like and what law students go through. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I forgot to say, in addition for those who are interested in teaching, the other thing that we also encouraged was pursuing a, a higher law degree. So most people are familiar with it with the Juris Doctor, mm -hmm. uh, but other students uh, have pursued what, what's called an LLM, a Master's in Law, and some schools call it an SJD, others call it an SJSD. It's basically the PhD on law degree. Oh, okay. And I know you folks have done work with um, Anue Nui mm -hmm. and also in yes. LSAT programs. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, for several years, we would we had a relationship with Anue Nui, and we did these six-week education modules where we introduced concepts of Native Hawaiian law and just, again, just introduced the basic concepts. And a lot of times those were in collaboration with either our professors or uh, attorneys like Moses Haya. Mm -hmm. uh, it was great. We, so again, we'd go there. It was a six to seven week program. We would also take them to the judiciary. And then in the last week, we'd bring them to the law school. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, we're unable to do what I thought was was one of the best parts is that C.J. Richardson, mm -hmm. when he was still alive, he would give each of the students uh, 
uh, certificate. Actually, we have a picture, I think, of them holding yeah, that there on this slide. Yeah. And um, and just to be clear, Kikula Kaipunio Anuenu is a K-12 school, so this is right. working with kids really early on, in a sense, yeah. in getting them introduced to these concepts. Yeah, we, we tended to work in, with the junior class, I think, in their okay. democracy, mm -hmm. democracy, something that was like part of the title of the class. Fantastic. Uh, with the LSAT prep, uh, that was something that we started when I was a first year law student and really was able to kick off during my second year, but it was an effort to help Native Hawaiian students uh, learn how to take the LSAT and develop strategies for taking the LSAT. And it evolved into providing uh, application support and get them to better strategize how they might submit their application. Right, and I know that's been, I've, I've had several students that I used to advise who have gone through this program and just made all the difference in the world in, in their application to law school. So. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Okay, I want to put in a little plug here, which is <laughs> Derek is the one who thought of this program when he was still a student. And right. I had just started at the law school teaching full time. And Derek came to me and said, I have this idea. We need to get funding. Can we collaborate? And so I just wanted to give that uh, <laughs> recognition to Derek. You know, it was, it was, a, it was a great time because I think that's when Professor McKenzie started working there. Um, I wasn't familiar with everything that she had done. Mm -hmm. um, I became her research assistant, but I didn't realize she was starting this Native Hawaiian law program. Um, right. So the idea that we started an LSAT prep class to get more Native Hawaiians and then a program focused on Native Hawaiian law, I think it really helped to increase the number of Native Hawaiian law students at the law school and then to give them a pro provide a program uh, for them to go through. And for all Native Hawaiian students or prospective students that might be watching the program, it really does help when you have more of an orientation program like that, so that even if people are first generation college students, they can learn all of the steps that it takes that everybody has to learn just to uh, go through the process of working on your degree and, and um, contributing mm -hmm. as a scholar. And that's really what we try to do at Kahuliao is to really have a pipeline project. So we support the application of Native Hawaiian students and students interested in supporting and studying Native Hawaiian law so we can help people get in the door, support them with tutoring and other projects while we're in law school, and then even transition with our post doctorate fellowship program so we can kind of um, make sure people are, you know, um, supported all the way through and that's help great. to place them really in our community during work where it's needed. So once the students get into law school with your support, what kind of support do you folks provide them kind of what Kapu was talking about while in law school? I think one of the one of the more important things that we do is I, we develop a culture. So I think that culture starts at, in the LSAT prep class. Mm -hmm. Law school is very demanding. Um, it's very challenging. And sometimes it can be very isolating. So I think what we've been able to do through the LSAT prep class is to introduce people together yeah. who are more likely, who oftentimes only want to go to Richardson. Mm -hmm. So they start forming friendships and relationships at a very early stage. And then they go through applying to law school together. They go through law school together and then eventually um, studying for the bar together. But I think developing that culture, it, it really encourages collaboration sure. um, and a lot of other, I th a lot of other skills. Uh, but we do a lot of counseling. Mm -hmm. um, we do a quite a bit of counseling, and I think with like the Native American Moot, Moot Court team, mm -hmm. I think that's another example where we, we help to develop a culture where uh, the students were able to kind of just take it. Um, but for the Moot Court team, winning isn't necessarily winning the awards, but um, it's the journey that they go through to get to, get to however competitive they are. And our school tends to be a very competitive uh, moot court team in the in the competition that focuses on indigenous issues. So I have a slide here and I'm going to ask you for those watching who have never heard of the moot court, can you explain what that <laughs> sure. is? Thank you. Um, I think a lot of people are more familiar with like a mock trial. Okay. Um, the moot court is like what happens after a trial. So mm -hmm. it's like when it's on appeal and it goes up to the appellate level court. So it, I, th I think for most people out there unfamiliar, just kind of conceptualizing what a mock trial is. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a simulation, and at the law school, it's, it's a competition. And it goes from Hawaii to the continent, and they... Well, for, for the particular one that focuses on federal Indian law or okay. indigenous issues, um, we have a team here, okay. and every year where the competition is held, it changes. So I it's see. a different school that... that uh, holds the competition. So they'll do a lot of practices here. It's been great because they get to meet a lot of active attorneys, uh, active and retired judges, law professors. Um, and then when they go to the competition, they tend to do very well. 
It's a kind of a way to, to practice your strategies and get feedback so that you're not intimidated in the actual courtroom. I yeah. think so. A lot of our <laughs> students used to complain that they practice too much, but <laughs> when they come back from the competition and they feel, I think, the results of all of their hard work, I think they realize then, you know, maybe they didn't over practice, but they tend to be very appreciative of the experience. Sounds very confidence building. Yeah. So let me just say one of the other things that our Native American Moot Court has done over the last, say, four or five years as part of their fundraiser is actually to make Lao Lao. <laughs> oh, they make it at, at Kanivai uh -huh. uh, for the last couple of years, and it's been a real, there's a little bit of complaining and then, but after they do it together, that's part of that building mm -hmm. the relationship. Yeah. It's really cool. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I know that there's also a certificate program. Right. Can you talk about that a little bit? Okay, I think we also have a slide kind of saying what some of the courses are. Um, so basically our certificate program is any law student who wishes to take um, a series of courses and get a Native Hawaiian Law Certificate is able to do so. So the basic course everyone must take will be Native Hawaiian Rights. Mm -hmm. And then um, experientially, either the Native Hawaiian Rights Clinic, the Environmental Law Clinic, an externship um, in, say, for instance, at the Office of Hawaiian Affairs mm -hmm. or at Kamehameha Schools, a place that you know is, uh, practices Native Hawaiian Law. Um, and then a series of other courses that they can take. There's a wide choice, federal Indian law, legal history of Hawaii. Um, Kapua teaches a water resources course. It has a slightly different name now. There's special topics if we have visiting professors or if one of us decides I'm really interested in the rights of indigenous peoples and that's what I want to teach on, then you know we'll, we'll develop a course that way. Um, a writing requirement, usually a big paper, second year seminar is required of all students and that's their big paper, it's four credits, it's like a 40 page massive <laughs> paper. A Native American Moot Court uh, also counts as part of that. Mm -hmm. So um, we're really proud of our graduates. We started the program, um, let's see, since 19, let, let, can you put the slide on so yeah. I can remember? Oh. <laughs> Um, Derek was one of the first, I think you were in the second group that right. got a certificate. And then it was a Pacific Asian Legal Studies certificate with a specialty in Native Hawaiian Law. And then we were able to get our own certificate program um, going. And now I will talk about it uh, at this point. We uh, recently um, graduated, we've graduated 76 students um, yeah. with their certificate. and then. Yesterday we graduated another 15. Oh, so that was so really exciting. cool. Congratulations. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Um, so, you know, Melody also, also mentioned that community outreach is a big part of what Kahuliao is about. Um, and we've, I think we've all been touched by that in so many different ways. I know this is important as a hands-on way to train future lawyers. Mm -hmm. and at the same time, a way to stay com committed to the communities you folks work with. Um, Kapoor, would you mind talking a little bit about some of the community outreach initiatives that you folks are engaged in? Absolutely. Community outreach is a huge part of what we do at Kahuliao, both um, as part of our educational philosophy and mm -hmm. our approach to learning, and we have many different sort of facets to our program. So for example, um, one of the things that we do, not just for our law school community, but for the community at large, is to host our Maoli Thursday lunchtime forum and discussion series. And so these are held the first Thursday of every month that law school is in session. And um, we feature different issues of importance to our community, just sort of as an example. This year alone, we hosted panel discussions on everything from Mauna Kea and Haleakala to the designation of a community-based subsistence fishing area in Haena on the island of Kauai. And the picture on this slide actually is from our October Maui Thursday series, where we were able to host Professor Linda Teaho, and she's from the University of Waikato in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And she came to share some of her experience with co-management regimes of natural and cultural resources, including um, her work on the Waikato River Settlement in particular. And although this is really targeted towards our law school community, as I mentioned, um, we get participation from folks across the university and really throughout our community. And I like to hope to think it's not just because we serve on a lunch, but <laughs> because, because our topics are really engaging and really highlight um, whatever's breaking news kind of at the time in our community. Sure. That's great. 
A second thing that we do is in partnership with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, we're very privileged to publish a series of four legal primers. So starting in 2007, we embarked um, on a contract with OHA where they asked us to work on putting together um, kind of a distillation of what the state of the law is. It's really targeted towards community members and helps to explain what the legal framework is, but really features what legal handles are available for them to help protect and restore their natural and cultural resources. So we started with a primer on fresh water um, because I was like, okay, I'll do it. Um, <laughs> and then after that, we focused on one on traditional and customary Native Hawaiian rights. So that includes things like um, accessing different undeveloped areas of the Ahupua or beyond in order to gather any of the natural or cultural resources that you might need for subsistence, cultural, or religious purposes. Um, so we, our second primer was on that. Our third was on Ivi Kupuna. Mm -hmm and the state and federal frameworks related to that. And our final one so far has been on quiet title and adverse possession. And so in addition to actually producing these legal resources and making them available to the community, and so far I've lost track, but thousands of copies have been distributed for free. Um, a key part of our outreach was really engaging in and grounding this work in our community. Mm -hmm. And so we facilitated trainings on each of the major islands and oftentimes um, we did more than one training in different communities. And that work started initially as part of our outreach around the publication of the primers, but we continue those that work today um, through our Native Hawaiian Rights and Environmental Clinics. That's awesome, thank you. Sure. <coughs> it's Actually, such a, oh, go ahead. I was gonna just say, um, I just requested one of these for a family friend who is going through some stuff um, with regarding quiet title, I believe. Right. And um, it was as easy as calling and getting a copy. Totally. And you know, the, my auntie was like, "Thank you so much. You know, this is so helpful." And I said, "You know, auntie, I really didn't do much. I just made a quick call." <laughs> but you know, it's it's right. really, really such a powerful tool for folks in community. So mahalo. A absolutely, and actually, these resources resources are available online. That's if right. anybody um, needs one or would like to check out one of the primers, they can go to our website, the Law School website, and under the Kahuliao section, there's a link for legal resources, and there you can click on and download any of our primers. Unfortunately, the ones that are on, online don't have the CD in the back, okay. which also includes forms and um, and cases and that sort of thing. But we're, of course, happy to make those available. So if people have a need for them or check it out online and would like a hard copy, they can contact us and we're happy to send some out. I was just going to say it's <clears throat> kind of like having your own survival kit. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it really helps the cultural practitioners to continue their work because yeah. the cultural Practice, practices not only depend on understanding current laws and also biases, but also the law depends on having as many cultural practitioners doing the, mm. the work of continuing our, our culture. So it's, it's a great balance. Yeah, and that's a big part of what we're trying to do is really kind of bringing our law to life kind of on the ground and in our communities, not just limiting it to kind of the ivory our academic experience, but really not just supporting our and co-powering our community members, but really getting our students out there and making them part of the experience I as think well. we have a slide, a photo of, of you folks um, doing some community outreach. Right, and yeah. I think the slide that we have here actually is one of the trainings that we did um, with Onipa Anahui Kalo, so um, organization of Kalo farmers from throughout our Pai'aina, and that I think also epitomizes what we try to do in order to kind of maximize our impact and get the most bang for the buck. We try to reach out to gatherings of people from mm -hmm. around Hawaii. We also did one for the Ahamoku councils, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, we really we really try to do that. And that, I think, also brings me to our A'o Aku A'o Mai initiative. Um, that's another partnership that we have with the Office of Hawaiian Affairs that began in 2011. And through that initiative, we provide direct legal services to rural Maoli communities in particular. And our emphasis is really to help provide is an access to justice issue, to help provide um, services where people wouldn't otherwise have the kind of legal support that they need. And it's an incredible learning opportunity for our students and fellows at the same time. And so we really, um, it actually began when OHA was inundated with requests for kokua because there was a lawsuit that had been filed around ancestral land on the island of Molokai. 
And there, you know, many, many people were named but didn't have attorneys to represent them. Mm -hmm. And so OHA approached um, the law school and the Ao Aku Ao Mai initiative was born. And that's really being facilitated through our clinics, our legal clinics. Through Kahuliao, we direct both the Native Hawaiian Rights and the Environmental Law Clinic. I um, help to manage the Environmental Law Clinic and Malia Akutagawa directs our um, Native Hawaiian Rights Clinics. And so these clinics are actually courses that are offered and that are targeted really primarily to second and third year law students. And it's a practical skills training really. So they work with real clients on real issues to help gain experience kind of practicing law, practicing, practicing law, if you will. <laughs> yeah. And we can actually go to court, um, but the students and fellows work under the direction of at least one attorney with significant experience in the area. And they do kind of everything short of that. So, um, but I should note too that the clinics are not limited to law students. We have had students from other disciplines enroll and um, really enjoy the experience and also contribute significantly. And given the success of these clinics, um, OHA has continued to support the effort. And now we've expanded beyond quiet title, which was the original case that we started with in um, 2011 and helped to also drive the publication of that particular primer to now um, include issues like water, traditional and customary Native Hawaiian rights, iwi kupuna, and really much, much more. Um, it's tons of fun and also with real life experience and impacts. And for me, it's been a really big part of how we at Kahuliao personally give back to the community community and I think it really epitomizes our educational philosophy and the whole a'o aku a'o mai aspect which is that it's not recognizing that the students um, aren't just um, sharing information with others but really that they gain so much more by being out there in the community working with folks. And this past fall for example our environmental law clinic assisted about 80 families on the island of Maui um, in Nava'eha who are really grappling with um, being forced into an administrative trial. Um, there are over 100 parties, um, many of them without the assistance of an attorney. And so the clinic went in there. We put together resource binders. We facilitated two trainings on island and then met individually with about 80 of the family representatives to help put together supplemental testimony exhibits and then file all of that um, with the Commission on Water Resource Management. So um, it was a great project, and we look forward to doing more work like that. You know, Kuali'i Council is so proud to, su to support <clears throat> programs like yours at the School of Law because partly it's also raising the consciousness of, of our people and of everyone in Hawaii um, to what it, the difference is in having sacred responsibilities right. as well as practicing according to uh, laws that, you know, have been instituted. And for people to reach that kind of critical mass of having everybody understand more at the same time is so important to having the support that we need to right. save our islands, to right. protect our islands. Absolutely. Mahalo. And finally, I think we have time for me to mention only one more aspect of our community outreach and education program at Kahuliao. But since 2013, we've again been partnering with OHA to provide legal and cultural training for recently appointed members of, of state and county boards and commissions, as well as folks who are recently um, elected to the Hawaii State Legislature. And so we facilitate mm -hmm. one-day trainings that are held several times a year on the public land trust, on water, iwi kupuna, and the non-traditional customary Native Hawaiian rights. And the numbers vary really based upon the number of appointments or elections, but we easily train several hundred people a year. And then based on folks' participation in that training, we've also had requests um, from agencies, uh, for example, to have a specialized training for their specific agency, and that's something that we're happy to do. And last year in 2015, the legislature passed Act 169, which made our training actually required wow. for members of um, specific <clears throat> boards, commissions, and council. So our next training is slated for July 16th at the law school. And that's really kind of a snapshot of what we do at Kahuliao. It's a lot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, on an individual basis, I think people do, you know, with Professor McKenzie and Professor Kutagawa, people do so much more, you know, speaking, lending pro bono assistance. Um, so it's it's a privilege to work with faculty who really walk the talk. Yes. Yeah. So we know there's been also an emphasis on research and publications, and um, I, we'd like to know more um, from Professor McKenzie. <laughs> <laughs> so he's to calling her Melody. Um, <clears throat> a little bit more about some of um, the highlights. Okay. So the big thing for all of us was last year we finished um, the we finished and it was published the Native Hawaiian Law Treatise, and so I have a I have a 
This is the hard copy. <laughs> this, this book is like 1,400 pages mm -hmm. long, which actually gives you an idea of how complex law is with relation to Native Hawaiians. Mm -hmm. um, we, this was a project that I had been working on uh, with the Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation. Um, way back in the 90s, we um, published something called the Native Hawaiian Rights Handbook. And so the idea was we were going to update the handbook. Um, I started working on it. I came over to the law school. One of the thing, one of the questions I had was, can I keep working on this project? And they said, great. And I sucked Kapoi into it. <laughs> and our, one of our other professors, um, <coughs> Susan Serrano, became a, a co-editor um, as well. I sucked a whole bunch of law <laughs> students into working on it. Derek worked on it when he was a law student and afterwards. And then many of our graduates also worked on specific chapters. Mm -hmm. um, so it's 21 chapters ranging from issues dealing with the, the status of Native Hawaiians under international law, US law, state law, our lands in all their all their forms, the public land trust, mm -hmm. the elite trusts, um, even programs such as Native Hawaiian healthcare, um, Native Hawaiian education, etc. So it's really a we hope a definitive, comprehensive <laughs> a definitive resource. <clears throat> and in doing this, we changed the name from the Native Hawaiian Rights Handbook mm -hmm. to a treatise really to reflect kind of the expansion in the law related to Native Hawaiians. Um, and we had some great partners. Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation continued to partner with us. And then Kamehameha Publishing was fabulous to work mm -hmm. with over the years to ensure it's beautiful. It's not only um, contains incredible knowledge, but it's also a beautiful book. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I attribute that to their, their staff and their hard work. Well, and one of Kamehameha's real commitments and investment in the book has meant that it's affordable for yeah. our community because so many books now you'll, you know, are, are little and they'll be a couple hundred bucks. Um, but you can actually get this online through Kamehameha's website or, you know, at Nemea, lots of other places. And it's really affordable, you know, anything from, from you know, 50, you can get a copy for $50 or less. So. It's such a compilation of the legacy of all the work that's been right. done. It's mm -hmm. just really a beautiful tribute to everyone's um, everyone's work and everyone at being an ohana at the School right. of Law to, to create this. It's a great gift. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> another initiative that we've had, um, again, through the generosity of Kamehameha Schools, mm -hmm. was a post-JD fellowship. Um, program, which we had for about four or five years, mm -hmm. um, where we would have recent graduates of the law school who are interested in Native Hawaiian law take one year to work on a specific topic um, and publish it in yes. a series that we called Ohia. Um, and Ohia, in this sense, is not the, the plant or the flower, but it's this idea of gathering up the mm -hmm. knowledge of our, of our people. And so we've had, um, I think, four or five publications, and we have two more that are coming out in the Ohia series. I have a um, slide of just a, a few of them yeah. here. Right. Yeah. Could you put that up? Mm -hmm. Great. Right. Yeah. And so, those are also available on our website. Yeah, those are, as Kapua said, available on our website awesome. as well. Um, and then, of course, each of us, um, as part of our responsibilities as professors, um, at the law school also have a scholarship agenda and work sure. on articles and, and things that, for me, the last few years have been really focused on completing the Native Hawaiian Law Treatise. But Kapua has been <laughs> very diligent and working really hard, and I am so proud of her recently, just last year, she actually received the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, mm -hmm. award as an emerging scholar. And partly for wow. her teaching as well as her scholarship. So we're really, really proud of that award. And we're also, um, it's also exciting because IUCN will be holding their um, right. convention here um, this fall in Soon. September. Yeah. yeah. And it's like there's like 1,300 member agencies and institutions in over 185 countries that, that participate. So we can expect something really incredible this mm -hmm. fall and, and Kahuliao and others at the law school will be very much involved. And we've got rising stars amongst yeah. us. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. Yeah, <clears throat> so, and then finally, I wanted to just kind of mention uh, Puna Viola, which is our um, 
part of our research and scholarship, but has been an effort over many years since we began, really, to um, create an online database of, um, you know, legal and historic and cultural documents that are of significance to Hawaii. It's had, it's been a difficult project, and we're very fortunate that Avis Poai mm -hmm. um, recently came on to, to do this full time. Um, we have some things up on the Puna Viola website, and I would encourage people to go and look. Um, for one thing, it's easy access to all of the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And so we wanted to focus specifically, of course, on the laws first, both in English and in Olelo, Hawaii. And we also have a number of the minutes from the Privy Council in English and Olelo, Hawaii, awesome. that are really fascinating to, to go back. I have my students read some of this. To, for instance, go back and look at what were the discussions in the Privy Council of the kingdom during the time of the Mahele. Right. What was the thinking? It's really fascinating stuff. So I, I would encourage people to go on and look on, on our website. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. What a rich website. Yeah. I've been on it a little <clears throat> bit and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need hours to sit here. <laughs> like it can be kind of addicting. Um, yeah. You know, so when we think about student preparation work and community outreach and research and all these things, obviously this is a robust learning environment for students. And that's such an exciting thing to think about. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what the successes actually have been for Native Hawaiians coming into the program and graduating and so on. Okay, well, you know, I did talk a little bit about our certificate program mm -hmm. and the numbers of people that we've graduated that's over right. the years. Um, I think we could definitely say that's kind of, that's a success for our students. Mm -hmm. Participation in our Native American Moot Court team, and Derek talked a little bit about that. That has been incredible for our students. Um, and we actually hosted the Native American Moot Court mm -hmm. here in 2012. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to host it every 10 years. And what that does is it brings scholars, um, professors, law students from across the country here to Hawaii to focus on an issue that we would then, right. you know, we would write the problem and students would have to focus on that. So it's kind of, it's kind of fun to do that. Um, other successes I think mm -hmm. we can point to, the establishment of Kuliao as an actual program within the law school. Sure. As I said earlier, when we started, we were funded under soft money from mm -hmm. the Native Hawaiian Education Grant. Over the years, with the support of our dean, and I really do have to say, our dean has been very supportive of mm -hmm. our program. We've been able to get substantial, you know, dedicated resources for our program, mm -hmm. as well as the positions through Kuli Council. Mm -hmm. So I think that in and of itself is a major accomplishment. And for our students, I think what it does is it gives them, I hope, the idea that the knowledge that there is a place for them at the law school, Absolutely. which didn't exist 10 years ago. Absolutely. There yeah. are people there who care, I mean, our, generally our faculty at the law school is very supportive and caring, but there are, are people who understand what it means to be Maoli in academic environment and can provide the support that's necessary. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. No, absolutely. And, you know, in the first um, show of this series, we talked about, we had Dr. Lili Kulakamele, Hiva, and Kili Igora talking about kind of the history of, you know, the university yeah. and how it has engaged with Hawaiians right. differently over time. And, um, I mean, that's, I think, one of the reasons for this series is to really celebrate and highlight these amazing things that when we talk about just 10 years ago did not yeah. exist, you know, um, and, and the numbers that we showed, you know, that just show how amazing a little focus can be on something that we know is important, that we're in Hawaii and that, you know, we have to make sure that Hawaiians are, you know, how there's a focus on Hawaiians right. and that there's some appropriate things. And like you said, it's not just Hawaiians who are benefiting from these programs. Definitely. Um, and we that have our a, community a number large. of non-Maoli students right. who are, become very interested um, in Native Hawaiian issues, and we hope that we're providing broader information to Absolutely. them as they go forward. We also have um, a number of Pacific Islanders, mm -hmm. and it's our goal to provide them more support and, and more co courses as well, and we've begun to do that. So that's kind of an accomplishment we're proud of. Absolutely, and I think what it sounds like to me is, you know, even non-Hawaiian students who are interested in this work, 
th these kind of programs provide an avenue for people who have passion to really right. do something about it, to take action. I mean, I even think about, and then to really provide, empower students, you know, Derek as a, as a law student saying, hey, there's a service that's not that's not here right now. Let's let's make it work, you know. Mm -hmm. So you know the stories I hear from you folks is really just providing this yeah. amazing platform to say yes. Let's let's do the things we know are important for our people. Yeah, and of course, then there's the long term, which is what do our students do after they graduate? Right. And I can say our students are everywhere. Mm -hmm. Derek is a good example. He's at the Office of Wine Affairs. Um, there are a number of graduates who work at the Office of Wine Affairs, and we're very proud of them. There are also some graduates that work at Kamehameha. Mm -hmm. um, others who decide to go to the private firms. But we hope that in, that in that decision to go to a private firm, they'll also be able to take on work that supports our community. Absolutely. Because there are firms, that, for instance, that work for various state agencies that, that would be helpful. Um, others who work for Earth Justice or Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation, Definitely. And mm -hmm. so I think we, in that way, we make a broader, bigger impact yeah. on our community. The state rep. Oh, oh yeah. right. Absolutely. <laughs> One of our graduates is, a, is a Jarrett Kiohokalole, okay. who is a representative from my, my area. That's, right. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Well, you know, Kuli Council's mission is um, to honor, empower, and advance Native Hawaiian people, culture, and language through excellence in higher education. and. Um, you certainly are doing that. I know as the director of a program, or two programs at the School of Nursing, actually, um, part of it is increasing the numbers, and part of it is raising the level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. right. And part of it is restoring the spirit of our people in our own homeland to be in the positions to not only contribute, but to lead. So we just wondered if you would like to share, each one of you, um, some thoughts about uh, what are the lessons that you have learned while engaged in all of this work? And also, what is one piece of advice that you would give to those thinking about law school in the future? Um, you know, I think one of the important lessons that I've learned uh, is that law school is very demanding. Um, and it's important to have really high standards when you're in law school. And uh, I probably. I, I think Kapua <laughs> came when I was in my last year of law school, yeah. so I, I didn't have a chance to take a class with her. I did take um, the class in the clinic with Professor McKenzie. And from being a student and working with them, uh, I've learned how important it is to set very high standards for yourself mm -hmm. as a law student and as an attorney. Um, and so I think that's, that's probably the important lesson. So and like I, integrity and what integrity, kind of other yeah. standards? Integrity, producing a very good work product. Mm. Um, and then the other one is in, in considering pursuing law school, it's, I think it's relevant also is that you need to have high standards um, all along the way. And so for those who are in undergrad or even graduate school and might still be considering a legal education, you know, it's very important if you want to be a competitive applicant to have set high standards for yourself, for your grades, and whatever other work you might do that you might uh, write about in your application package. Uh, but law school, like I said earlier, is very demanding. I'm also in the PhD program. And I'm not going to say you know, one is better than the other, but what I can say is that there, there are very, uh, two very different standards mm -hmm. uh, in the PhD program and in the law school. Um, and you know what law school does, it prepares you for a very specific profession. Mm -hmm. And there are other professional standards. You have professional responsibilities. Uh, you, you, get, you work towards getting a license, and you need to make sure that you don't do anything uh, that would cause you to lose that license. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's part of having high standards. Great. Mm -hmm. right. <clears throat> I guess to build on what Derek has just shared, for me, sort of what one piece of advice that I would give is, um, is to really for those people who are considering law school as part of their future, to, to give it a lot of thought and to think specifically about what they would like to do and how they would use their law degree personally and kind of, and for me in particular, and because of the mission of our law school for the betterment of the community. Um, I love my undergraduate experience. I felt like I grew as a person and you know, I just went to met all these cool people and thought about things in different ways. And law school's not like that in the same way. I mean, it's a professional school as Derek mentioned. And so it's three years of training about how to write, how to talk, how to, um, how to you know, work and think as an attorney. And so 
if you're thinking about it, um, but you're not sure, you know, what area you want to practice in, for example, or if you even want to practice, I'd encourage you to volunteer or to attend some of the events at the law school or to sit in on classes or somehow gain more experience to see specifically kind of how you would put your law degree mm -hmm. to work. Because it's it's not like undergraduate in the sense that, you know, you can start and then sort of find yourself partway through. <laughs> um, that's certainly possible, but you can make so much more of the opportunity and the experience if you come in kind of knowing what you want to do. And then just as far as a lesson that I learned um, at Kahuliao, um, I think one of the things that I learned in particular was a role of higher education in bringing the law to life on the ground and in the community, and specifically how that can be done. I think one of the best things that I was able to do when I came to Kahuliao was spend time with CJ Richardson, mm -hmm. because he was still hanging around in our offices <laughs> when I started, and just to be able to sit and pick his brain about, yeah. you know, what were you thinking when you wrote this case, and how is, but for me, that really emphasized the role of grace, mm -hmm. um, or aloha in doing this work because you know coming from so many years in litigation is you learn to be the warrior yeah. and that's part of it but you also need to to figure out kind and of, having um, kupuna wisdom right right, right. and so that yeah. was that was a great lesson for me Mahalo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so kapua just mentioned cj richardson so i have this little story to tell when um i was teaching native Hawaiian rights one year and cj was still around um, one of our, uh, one of the things I have students do is give a presentation on an important case. Mm -hmm. And so I had some students who were presenting on a case um, that we call Kalipi versus Hawaiian Trust. It's one of the very most, right. the very first and most important state uh, cases in modern times on traditional and customary rights. And so these students are in front of the room presenting on the case and who walks in the door it was cj richardson's case he wrote it he wrote the decision and he walked in the door and everybody went oh my gosh there he is i mean it was such a cool moment and so um when they were paul with their presentation we got to sit down with him and you know he asked answered questions that students had so that was pretty amazing um, but turning back to the questions you asked what is a lesson that I learned while engaged at, at Kahuliao. I think one lesson I learned was probably um, to kind of trust that things will work out. I mean, that's kind of been my philosophy all my life. And when I decided to come to the law school, I took this kind of leap of faith that whatever was going to happen would be good. It would be a good result. Yeah. Um, is and that it, still your? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's definitely personal it's prophecy. Definitely, yeah, it's definitely worked out, and so um, I just feel so grateful for all the support along the way. Yeah. To, you know, for Kapua being willing to leave Earth Justice to come and work with us, mm -hmm. uh, for Susan, who who you you all met at, at various times, and she's an incredible scholar, and she added that whole depth to our program. For Derek's, um, you know, from the very beginning, his interest in ensuring that there were Native Hawaiian right. students in our law school and that they were getting the support that they needed. Right. So I think all along, part of what the lesson I've learned is to trust that it will turn out um, and that with, the, especially with the right people there, right. attracting the right people and um, kind of making sure they're happy and want to stay. <laughs> well, best job ever. ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So as far as one piece of advice to give to uh, those who are thinking about law school, I mean, I want to echo what Derek said um, and what Kapoor said. It's very, very um, difficult, demanding um, place. But if you have a passion for work in our community, learning the law, even if you don't practice, you might not mm -hmm. practice. You might decide to be, uh, you know, work in policy areas or become a legislator, mm -hmm. or you know, and that's super important for our community. Mm -hmm. We need more Native Hawaiian legislators, Absolutely. and we need more more Native Hawaiians in the judiciary and in the administration. Mm -hmm. And so, if we can help that along, that would be fabulous. I got off course. That one piece of advice. Um, one of the things they haven't kind of mentioned is making the commitment to go to law school can be very, very difficult on someone's family. Yeah. So you, before you decide to go to law school, before you decide to take that path, make sure you've talked to your family, especially yeah. if you're, you have children or if you're 
when you're married and have a spouse or a partner, make sure that they understand what that, that commitment yeah. means for everyone in the family. It's not just, it's not, right. it's not one person alone. Yeah. Right. Um, and yeah, and so that's part of what I would tell people to think about. But also, on a more optimistic note, think about all the, all the wonderful things you can do in our community. And there's so, there's such a great need. And when I see our students graduating and taking roles in the community, I'm so, we're all so like proud yeah. of mm -hmm. what they've been able to do and where they're going. Absolutely. I think it's also great for people to understand that social justice is having the right intentions, but knowing what the right actions are to reach the right outcomes. Right. And it sounds like that's, it's kind of a training ground for people to understand. I know in, um, <clears throat> when we had the Department of Native Hawaiian Health here, one of the things we were talking about is that our native population is about to double in the next yeah. 20 years or so. And we wanna make sure that people have more of the opportunity to go through an educational process, whether it's cultural practitioner process or law school or nursing or education, whatever it is, so that we're more prepared uh, as a collective to have the kind of coherence that existed in our culture when our culture was uh, what was practiced in Hawaii. Mm. Because the integrity of the, of the aina of the land actually was expressed in the voice of the people. And so I feel like, you know, partly law is helping, your work is helping us to return to mm. that kind of understanding, as well as, as many of the 20 programs that Kuli'i uh, advocates for at Manoa and then if you look at it in terms of ahupua and kind of a cultural um, organization throughout the whole UH system, we now have Native Hawaiian programs on all 10 campuses and meet as a council and then representatives of that council meet with the UH administration. So not only has each program grown so beautifully, but the context itself has become more a part of our culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we have to share as Kanaka Oidi, is that our culture itself has so much uh, reflection in it of the aloha that the people have for the aina, and that the aina uh, is what nourishes all of us and, and supports our life on so many levels. So we're really happy to have you here with us today. And Punihe, would you like to yeah, give no, some commentary? Just, you know, Mahalo Nui, you, one thing that you said about, about families. And I remember um, Auntie Nanette Judd, Dr. Nanette Judd, um, who used to be the, the director of um, Imi Ho'ola in the medical school, um, talked about the same thing mm -hmm. when she was giving um, me some advice one day when we were talking about students. And she said she'd always have to check with the families, right? Because we know how important families are in this support of higher education. And, and sometimes there's, it's scary because still for a lot of Native Hawaiian families, we are the first generation, you know, sending these babies off to this scary place um, that is just, just <laughs> unknown, right? And, and, and then when we hear about these kind of support programs, when we hear about Kuli Council and the work that everybody is doing and folks can, can tune in and, and see these you know, beautiful faces of folks who are doing this incredible work, um, I think that this really inspires and gives people um, fearlessness and courage to to come and do the things that they're so passionate about. Um, and, and like Nalani was mentioning, not just to have intention, but having the tools to engage in the correct action. So um, we just really want to say mahalo to all of you. Mahalo for inspiring um, our students. Mahalo for inspiring <coughs> our families and really giving us tools to, to advocate for ourselves in our own communities. Um, I have this last slide here with some contact information so that if folks are interested in learning more about the work you folks are doing, whether it's downloading a primer or getting into law school, um, that information is there. And um, so they can call or they can um, find all the contact information on your, on your, um, at your email. Right. Um, and that we can always go to the law school website as well. Right. So um, again, on, be, be, on behalf of Nalani and I, thank you so much for being here today in the middle of, I think, your lunch break from a all day conference. <laughs> um, and we will whisk you away and take you back so no one gets in trouble. And, and also to the two of you, thank you so much for your leadership and for your time here today. And all your work. Yeah. Mahalo. 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 Mahalo.